discussion, we've got the first topic, which is coronavirus outbreak. How cloud technologies, AI, MI, are helping us deal with the pandemic. We're looking at putting AI at the core of an organization and uh, uh, businesses and operating models. We're looking at accelerating digital transformation using artificial intelligence, data analytics, and hybrid cloud in a post-pandemic world. Solving uncertain and variable supply and demand in the market through data analytics, using AI and data analytics to predict and support operations and supply disruptions, suboptimal mm -hmm. workforce allocation, and changing consumer confidence and priorities. While our panelists are Sutovu Wong, the Director Analytics and Information Management, Ministry of Health, Singapore. While Satovo being a Director Analytics and Information Management Division at the Ministry of Health, which is MOH Singapore, he's responsible for analytics strategy, management and uh, prioritization of analytics portfolio, capability development, data management and data science in MOH. Well, we also have uh, Janelin uh, Michali now, the Information uh, Technology Officer, Department of Information and Communication Technology, Government of Philippines. Uh, well, Janelin is experienced in uh, technology and is a cybersecurity policy maker with demonstrated history of working in public policy. Uh, skilled in information security, public speaking, information technology strategies, technical writing, and technological quality management. We also have uh, Dr. Jasim Haji, the President Artificial Intelligence Society Bahrain. Well, uh, Dr. Jasim has uh, management and uh, executive experience in aviation, hospitality, technology, and telecommunication for over 30 years. Well, he served on the board of directors of leading hospitality and tourism technology provider in the Middle East and on the CETA uh, Council representing Middle East and North Africa. Furthermore, he has been a part of the Bahrain Center of Excellence, which is overlooking excellence in the public sector. We also have Mauricio uh, Campo, uh, Campos Suarez, who's a technology and innovation expert, Novartis, uh, Switzerland. Well, a forward thinking leader, passionate about organizational culture, coaching leadership, impactful innovation, and digital transformation. A directorial uh, role in multinational healthcare company, professional coach, and entrepreneur. Proven track of uh, record uh, building talent and driving results in different countries, continents, leading globally distributed teams in highly complex organization. Well, this entire conversation in the panel is going to be moderated by Haslina Binti Selamat, who is the director at Touch Southern Barhad, Malaysia. Well, uh, Haslina is an associate professor and a professional engineer at uh, the Electrical Engineering Faculty, University Technology, Malaysia. She's been the vice chair of IEE, IEEE Control uh, System Society, Malaysia chapter, and also the founding member and currently the honorary secretary of Malaysian Society of Automatic Control Engineering, which is inter the International Federation of Automatic Control national member organization for Malaysia. So well, we have our incredible panel who's joining us here, who've been a part of this. Thank you so much for joining. Over to the entire panel. Haslina, requesting you to kindly unmute yourself. Right, right. okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavana. <clears throat> Uh, right. Um, Assalamu alaikum and good morning. My name is Haslina, as introduced uh, by our host. Uh, uh, as you know, I'm a researcher at the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Robotics and a lecturer at the School of Electrical Engineering, University of Technology, Malaysia. And I would like to welcome all of you to the World AI Show, e-hosted in Malaysia. So I'll be moderating um, this panel discussion session. Uh, entitled Coronavirus Outbreak, uh, how cloud technologies, artificial intelligence, and machine intelligence are helping us deal with the pandemic. So uh, coronavirus has been a really hot topic for the last six, seven months, and it should be because it is affecting so many people at every corner of the earth, east to west, north to south. So it is difficult uh, uh, it is not difficult to see um, why this topic is chosen today. So we're very lucky to have our esteemed panelists in this session 
who will be talking about AI and coronavirus. We have Mr. Sutowo Wong um, from Singapore. We have Mr. Suarez uh, from uh, Novati, Switzerland. We have Ms. Makalinau, um, the IT officer, Department of ICT, Philippines, and Dr. Haji, uh, the president of AI Society, Bahrain. So thanks uh, for being here, <clears throat> especially Mr. Suarez and Dr. Haji. I think it is around 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning over there uh, in Bahrain and Switzerland. Thank you very much. Um, so let's start by uh, inviting each of our panels to uh, briefly, very briefly, uh, introduce yourself and what are the exciting things that you do at the moment related to uh, AI, cloud computing and machine learning. Uh, let's start with um, Mr. Uh, Sutowo Wong. Um, is he here? Haslina is not here. He's not here. Okay, okay. Let's move on to um, uh, Mr. Suarez, please. Hello. Good morning, everybody. And thank you for having me. Um, you know, reality is that for healthcare, a large pharma like Novartis, um, this is a tremendous transformation, right? Uh, I think that we are um, in many ways disrupted by, by COVID, but more especially how technology helped us in this moment is um, a great value. Um, you know, personally, I've been having the chance to work, uh, actually, I very recently joined Novartis um, for another large pharmaceutical company. And, have, you know, both of them uh, are pretty much on the same phase uh, in terms of transformation. The, the reality is that we at Novartis, we are really uh, taking the lead on terms of artificial intelligence as an enabler uh, for um, for really transforming the way we we operate both at the hcp engagement that is one key part for us to spread our scientific knowledge uh, and on the other hand on, on patients on patient in terms of really patient education awareness uh, and really working with payers and associations just to really enhance the way we do healthcare. Uh, in that space, artificial intelligence is especially useful, uh, especially impactful, because the reality is that from every stage, uh, from our pharmaceutical uh, product, from the very early research phase where we can identify the right patient for the right trial, uh, to the commercialization and, and, and getting to treatment, of our drugs and uh, really is super impactful. And we use it in the front of HCP engagement when it comes to artificial intelligence to really recommend the way forward for our um, HCP and, and customer facing organization. Uh, and also we do use it now with recently launched a chatbot uh, for our patient engagement in terms of understanding more about the disease, understanding more about their behaviors. Uh, and this is only the start. Uh, I think that the as much more data uh, and quality of data going to become available, uh, this is going to become even more and more excited. Uh, um, you know, I'm very sure that now with the momentum that we gained because of COVID, many of these technologies that has been dormant in a way for, for many years now going to take momentum and take off um, in a big way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, what about Miss? Um, uh, uh, I think we cannot. Uh, can you please um, unmute? We, we cannot hear it, right? All right. Uh, it's, it's All right. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hoping everyone is. Uh, you know, in the best of health at this time. And uh, once again, thank you for uh, inviting the Department of ICT uh, to this conference. Actually, in the Philippines, uh, harnessing the power of technology has come to the fore in, uh, in addressing the current COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we have had uh, local talents working with the government, developing innovative uh, tools to, to fight the pandemic. Uh, there's been a lot, uh, but there's this one that uh, I'd like to briefly discuss. Uh, there's uh, the use of mobile AI-enabled thermal scanners. Uh, this is actually done uh, in partnership with the private sector. 
Uh, these are uh, artificial intelligence powered thermal scanners mounted on drones uh, to easily scan and pinpoint people with high body temperature. Uh, these drones actually uh, they provide real-time data transmission, are equipped with GPS and has a two kilometer range for communication. This technology actually the main uh, objective is to shorten the queuing of people and minimize contact between individuals in checkpoints. So that's just one. There's also the contact tracing apps uh, that's being developed uh, by, again, by local talents in uh, being supported by the government. And uh, there is a lot more that uh, we're looking into to help contain uh, the, the virus and to, um, to achieve the objectives that has been set by the interagency task force of the country in, in managing this uh, emerging uh, pandemic. So, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Makali Nal, for the introduction. Uh, we will then move on to uh, Dr. Jasim Haji. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you for hosting us here. It actually comes very nicely at this early time. We have our prayers and then join the meeting. So uh, just uh, to uh, give you a little bit of background, you know, we are in Bahrain, uh, a very... Uh, excited, looking forward to the technologies that's been implemented. I, I think, uh, if I may say it, there is nothing optimistic about this COVID, but, but if there is one, it's uh, accelerating uh, the use of AI and the digital transformation, the, the predictions that we had that in the next two, three years, some of the technologies will be implemented. Now we see them around the corner. and. Uh, being a small uh, country, uh, as big as Singapore probably, um, we consider ourselves the, the hub of the Middle East in terms of uh, developing talents and R&Ds in the area of AI, and we have uh, institutes who do that. Um, so the, the future looks like, you know, uh, uh, all GCC countries will be the biggest uh, expenditures of the, the AI probably in the whole world with what is, is happening in the green fields and the uh, analytics that is coming up. So uh, we have all seen recently the chatbots and the difference is that we're doing it in a different language and not traditional English or standards that is available with Google or Microsoft is all converted into more complex with the specific dialects of Arabic, uh, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and big data, chatbots, and, and other analytics. So uh, we were the first in the, in the world to develop uh, sentiment analysis using big data and AI in terms of analyzing the social media uh, during the pandemic and where it is heading, what are the discussions done and making uh, predictions of that and plus uh, various uh, voice and text chatbots um, uh, for customer uh, interactions for citizens who need uh, more information with wealth of data and the APIs that's available worldwide um, plus uh, the use of that would be one of the first to use the, the mobile apps for relocating uh, citizens or understanding the, uh, the congestions. Um, that's basically, you know, the, the, all the projects coming together to, to handle the, uh, the pandemic. But nevertheless, one of the first places that going more than 80 to 90 percent uh, uh, moneyless, if you like to call it, was using the, the, the online transactions in, in every aspect of from starting from the small grocery shops to big organizations and the money transfer is no, no longer an issue with us. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Haji. Yes, uh, I would like to welcome um, Mr. Sutawa Wong um, to the session. Um, right, uh, maybe uh, you could uh, start by introducing yourself uh, briefly and uh, share with us um, briefly what you um, or, or Singapore is doing at the moment, the exciting ones related to COVID-19 uh, management. Yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, so, Sutawa here. I, I lead analytics and information management in the Ministry of Health in Singapore. Uh, in terms of the things that we do, uh, uh, perhaps I, since uh, we, we talk, want to talk a lot about cloud computing and AI, uh, then I'll just focus on those, uh, some of the things that we're, de- uh, that we're doing in dealing, how we deal with this pandemic. First on cloud computing, uh, I, I think a lot of uh, the, 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 the attendees here and also the panel, uh, pan- the panel panelists, would probably uh, would have uh, seen a lot of the supply chain disruption uh, that's happening globally. And, and uh, Singapore is uh, not spared either. And what happened was that a lot of the things that we want to get delivered, the, a lot of the hardware, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, building up our IT system, actually get delayed. Uh, and so this actually is a perfect opportunity for us to ac- accelerate our cloud adoption, uh, which in turn actually help us uh, speed up our implementation. So uh, we have a government commercial cloud. Uh, so we don't just use a public cloud. What we have is a public cloud that's configured. Uh, we work with all the big uh, cloud players, uh, uh, quite a few of the big cl- cloud players. And uh, we configure it to be able to um, uh, comply with a lot of our uh, security protocols and our uh, compliance rules. And that's what we call the government commercial cloud. So with that up and running, uh, we were able to uh, accelerate a lot of the uh, uh, migration or application or building up of the new applications in the cloud. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we have digitalized all aspects of our pandemic response, uh, all the way from testing, uh, management of the, the people who are going for tests, uh, the contact tracing process, quarantine operations, uh, case management. Uh, for example, for the COVID uh, positive patients, uh, we have uh, a, co- a command and control system that allow us to do the conveyancing or the movement of the people across the different facilities, whether it's healthcare facilities in a hospital or isolation facility in a community uh, uh, down to the discharge. And then uh, we have uh, apps that help us with movement control and also uh, how we can provision safe management in workplaces and in, in the venue where uh, crowd tend to congregate. Uh, specifically on AI, we do have a, a reporting, a location reporting app. Uh, it's a mobile app for those who are on a stay home notice or home quarantined. The app will periodically ping the people throughout the day uh, with a custom URL and to ask them to share their location. And this uh, this collects the, the data on the back end and presents this information to the enforcement agencies to know where the people are. And, and that's where AI also comes in because uh, we want to detect anomalies and possibly GPS moving uh, because we don't want people to uh, 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 pretend they're in certain places when they are not. So AI is used in the process. And we have also deployed a natural language processing solution to pick up uh, COVID-related symptoms from our clinical notes. So we have a lot of uh, a wealth of information that's found in an unstructured way within the clinical notes that are entered by the doctor. And, and uh, until we have an NLP solution, there's actually no easy way for us to be able to pick up a lot of these uh, symptoms uh, for us to do syndromic surveillance. And that's also then, after we have picked up all the different symptoms, uh, we are then able to also map the data geospatially uh, look at both uh, spatial and temporal um, um, trend analysis to see how we can then look for emerging transmission clusters. So this is an example, uh, just two examples of how uh, we use AI. And, and in general, uh, we have adopted cloud computing quite a fair bit. And this, this has helped us actually accelerate a lot of the work that we do. Over. Thank you very much, Mr. Wong. Um, so it's really interesting to, uh, to listen to various uh, applications of cloud computing and AI from different parts of the world. And um, I think the audience would really love to know a little bit more about uh, some of the implementations. Um, yes, there are really some interesting uh, applications. Uh, the question is, uh, to what extent um, that uh, these um, 
applications uh, are deployed in, in real situations, considering all the different probably geographical challenges, like in, in the Philippines, for example, and maybe not so in, in Singapore, but in, in countries where uh, there are, you know, um, uh, constraints in deploying this technology, um, how, um, uh, well, this question is probably for Ms. Makali now, um, how uh, does the government um, um, uh, assist in um, making sure that deployment of these technologies uh, uh, reach as, probably not all, but as many uh, citizens as possible and that it will benefit as many people as possible? Yes, uh, actually, it's really been a challenge. Uh, in the Philippines, we are an archipelago. And uh, as some of you may know, we're made up of around uh, 7,000 more islands. And so it is uh, this, the, the implementation of uh, these apps that, that are supposedly uh, aimed at containing the virus has really been a challenge for the government. Uh, there is this interagency task force uh, that has uh, come into place uh, with the enactment of a of our Bayanihan Act. It's actually a law uh, that was signed uh, in order to contain this uh, national health emergency. And uh, what it's composed of various government agencies, including uh, the Department of Interior and Local Government. And so what the government did was, uh, aside, from, uh, aside from engaging the national government agencies, of course, uh, you will need the local government units for this through the De Department of Interior and local government. And uh, for example, the, the technology that I mentioned earlier, the thermal uh, scanners, as, as was mentioned by our, uh, one of our panelists, there has been a um, a, a challenge with the supply chain, the movement of uh, supplies across the, the country. And part of that is that the checkpoints, uh, because of the implementation of thermal scanning and all, uh, would take longer uh, because you'll need to check all, all the, uh, the, the vehicles coming through. And so with the implementation of these thermal scanners that has uh, somehow helped that challenge, and this was only made possible uh, because of the engagement with the local government units and uh, also the law enforcement because they're the ones uh, manning the checkpoints. So we have the Philippine National Police uh, engaging the local government units uh, by manning the checkpoints and uh, making sure that uh, these, these technologies are are. Uh, being used efficiently uh, to, to uh, with the sole purpose of containing the virus. All right, thank you. Um, all right, we have one question from the pen. Uh, sorry, from the audience, uh, Atika Izati Masrani. The question is. During uh, the coronavirus outbreak, we're not only dealing with a pandemic, but also with infodemic, where it's difficult to differentiate authentic and fake news. Um, how can cloud technologies and AI be leveraged to curb this? So who would like to take these questions? Any of the panels who uh, want to uh, respond to this? Maybe um, Mr. Suarez, is that okay for you? Well, um, I I don't have quite experience on, on that specific topic. We don't deal so much on, on fake news on, on the scientific community itself, uh, but we do have you know an active um, participation on on several committees when it comes to to really providing the right com uh, the right type of information to the patient at the right time, right? Um, but again, it, it doesn't probably answer the question, so, so probably I'm not the best suitable person to, okay. to provide an answer there. Oh, sorry, thank I you. Mind, uh, yes, please, please, use, uh, thank you. When we use the big data sentiment analysis, which uses a lot of social media information to analyze in, in Arabic, uh, 
We also um, use the machine learning for double authentication. So you just don't go and uh, fetch the news from one source and then analyze it and start making a prediction from that because that could lead you to total uh, wrong location. So uh, that uh, algorithm that put in place that looks at and, and it goes, it learns the patterns of the news and it learns uh, the, the, about the sources, which is kind of putting an AI in security and uh, looking at various uh, predictions that have happened and the sources in the past that those news have been uh, spread around. So that pretty much uh, authenticates, uh, you know, the, the fake news to genuine users. Thank you very maybe much. I can, okay. Maybe I can yeah. share as well, uh, so the work here. So uh, for, for us, the approach is that we know upfront that uh, there's this, uh, uh, I, I quite like this term infodemic, um, where uh, a lot of fake news are being circulated. Uh, it's still being circulated today. Uh, we, we, we knew that we had to tackle this upfront very early on. Um, so what we did was, it's not so much of an AI solution, but rather we have established um, a few things, right? One is, uh, official sources of information and disseminated to people in a timely manner. We have a WhatsApp group uh, um, where people can actually uh, join and then they can get alerts on uh, the situation on the pandemic. We do report the number of cases every day. So the number of cases uh, coming from different sources, uh, whether it's an imported case, it's a case in the community. Uh, we also then report the number of people who have been discharged uh, and in the end, how many people, how many patients are still left uh, within the system who are being cared for by our healthcare professional. So I think uh, having different channels through which we can reach out to people to share official news is important. Uh, so we use WhatsApp, we use Telegram, uh, we have it on our website and we promote it. Uh, we have it on TV as well, uh, uh, radio. Uh, so people can have easy access to a lot of this official information. Second is also uh, not just timely information in a channel that is uh, 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 where people are going for or convenient for people to access, but also uh, being transparent about the, the situation uh, where we report uh, every single case. And, and we also do a lot of aggressive testing uh, out in the community and also uh, hotspots where we think a uh, potential poor infection may be uh, happening. So we do a lot of this testing and then all these numbers are being reported. Uh, so for us, it's really about timely, accurate information that are uh, disseminated in a transparent manner. Uh, so that's our way of combating the, the fake news. Not so much of uh, looking and using uh, advanced AI to identify which are the fake ones, but really uh, making sure that people have access to the official news and, uh, in an easy manner. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, thank you, uh, the, the panels. Um, all right. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm a researcher and I think all researchers in the world would realize that the literature on coronavirus has grown as much as the virus transmission itself. You know, they, all, they both grow exponentially. Some sources say that there are currently over 28,000 scientific articles um, on this topic. Uh, well, just too many for us to, to read and digest. Um, for example, if I go to the United States uh, National Institute of Health COVID-19 portfolio, uh, which is a website that tracks uh, papers related to coronavirus from early this year, and I search for the term artificial intelligence, it would list 1,135 publication. If I put AI, 2,301 machine learning 1,516. Uh, so basically, there are so many studies, analysis, suggestion, methodologies on how to handle or manage uh, this virus, as well as um, the disease or complications that it causes. Uh, so the next question I think is for uh, uh, Dr. Haji. Um, so, you know, with this vast information, how do we filter uh, and prioritize which approach or which aspect of the pandemic that uh, we should use um, AI for and how, how this is decided. Uh, for example, uh, at the government level or uh, at the ministerial level. Um, 
if you like to summarize the entire uh, AI usage in the pandemic, I would put three that we use two of them. Uh, I'll start with the one that we don't use. Uh, that is uh, using AI uh, for vaccine development. This is for you know countries who have uh, or pioneers in development of vaccines. I, I believe uh, some elements of it was used in the uh, news that two days ago Oxford uh, developed a, a vaccine, vaccine. tested, and uh, there is a perspective of having it. I believe that was tested on uh, over. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, 1,100 uh, patients. Uh, and there was an element of uh, AI used in, in the lab for that. Uh, that's, that's in general, that was, we knew right from the beginning uh, that machine learning and predictive analysis will fast track. It will not do anything more than what the people in the labs will do, but it will uh, probably prompt the, the development and the progress on that. The other two parts that is used in many locations, and I think the, the difference is, um, is tweaking it to the geographical locations. You know, for, for instance, there are countries with the uh, condensed locations, like Bahrain, as I said, an example. Uh, we are small countries and uh, huge population. So to track them is more difficult, I believe, than the countries which have a wider geographical locations, because then you will have to go to the neighborhoods to find out accurately where are the gatherings happening and, and where are the spread is and how you track them. So we were the first to, to apply that, of course, recently, the, the Google and Apple uh, bilateral agreements to provide the APIs on, on the Android and iOS to many countries that, that has helped. Uh, the world to to interact with their system and so we did with our ministries and I think the third one is to manage the the employees using the AI during the pandemics and uh, you know uh, handling uh, the medical stuff the, the security uh, the workforce because you have a lot of believe it or not uh, 70 to 80 percent of the workforce are volunteers and these are people coming at the time of the pandemic and you have little data about them in the, uh, in the official organization. So you'll have to create data sets and try to manage them. That becomes a challenge, you know, with AI and not having so much data and then you have to create them. But fortunately with uh, machine learning and continuous search and interfaces with different uh, databases, we were able to do that. So I think all in all this, uh, these are the three main uh, segments that this AI used. Thank you. And you mentioned about how, uh, I mean, uh, that uh, AI in Bahrain uh, is not used for uh, vaccine development, right? So. Um, uh, this, uh, this one question related to this from one of the uh, audience, um, how AI can help finding health-related solutions uh, that can help accelerate uh, finding biological remedies or vaccines for any such pandemic infections um, uh, that we are currently experiencing or in the future? Uh, maybe um, uh, Mr. Suarez can, can explain um, to the audience like how AI is used. Uh, yeah, no, probably not the right person. I'm, you know, pretty much working on the commercial side of, of the parties. And I, I, on top of that, we don't uh, really work on, on vaccines um, oh. at Novartis. So sorry for that. <laughs> what about the, um, the, the, probably the other, uh, players or, or, or if you know any information about how, how this is used? How yeah, used no, I, I cannot, you know. I That's all right, any, all right. Any Fine, background on research, you. sorry for that. <laughs> okay, all right. Yeah. Oh, 
Um, Haslina requesting you to kindly unmute yourself. Sorry, sorry, I forgot to unmute. Right, uh, okay, sorry. The next question is about um, uh, people's responses or feedbacks or uh, expected responses, you know, uh, in the use, in the extensive use of um, ICT uh, and AI technologies when dealing with pandemic situations. How comfortable are they generally? Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Makalina, if you would like to respond to this. Yes, uh, so there has been a, while generally the, the technologies that have been uh, put in place is, has been generally accepted, there has been a concern in terms of uh, data privacy, like for contact tracing apps, uh, since uh, this, this contact tracing apps actually uh, uses information on, on a, uh, based on uh, communications data, GPS, you know, and uh, the use of Bluetooth uh, technology. Uh, the, of course, there's the information on location and, and such. So there has been a growing concern actually on the use of, of these uh, uh, technologies in terms of data privacy. And uh, the good thing is that uh, in the Philippines, we have the Data Privacy Act, uh, which is somehow which somehow acts as a um, it somehow balances uh, the the need for uh, these technologies and uh, data privacy concerns. Uh, the National Privacy Commission of the Philippines has been actively working uh, with the the, the other government agencies, uh, especially with the DICT, which I'm from, the Department of ICT, in making sure that uh, the data privacy provisions of the law are taken into consideration in the development of these apps. Uh, so, yeah, there, there's, uh, there's a good balance there because of the laws that we have in place in terms of uh, data privacy. What what about in Singapore, Mr. Wong? How do you uh, manage uh, data privacy issues when you deploy? I think you're using uh, Singapore is using uh, quite extensively, you know, data collection um, systems and all that. So yes, yeah? yep. So so th thanks for the question. Uh, the way we deal with it, there are a few levels, right? Um, first is uh, we take uh, what we call a data minimization principle, meaning we only collect data that is necessary for us to do the work. Uh, second is that uh, I think we need to be clear that uh, even if we have a lot of the uh, uh, mobile applications or a lot of ICT applications that are used uh, in, better in contact tracing or, or other uh, COVID-related work, um, the data, we are not doing a population-wide surveillance. Right? So I think that one has to be clarified. Uh, no, I don't think any of the government, especially not in Singapore, uh, where it, we are not definitely definitely not using the app to do a population wide surveillance, but instead, when someone is tested positive uh, for COVID nineteen, what we will do then is to request the person uh, to submit the data to us, uh, the data that is residing within the phone. So, uh, uh, so, so that is our approach, and we only collect the data from uh, the the COVID positive patients, not everyone. In fact, uh, uh, there is a process where uh, there's a submission of data by the individual. So, so that's the first thing. I, I think uh, ideologically, there are differences, right? Uh, we see that, uh, in, at least in terms of contact tracing, uh, that's how I heard uh, the, the mention of uh, the exposure notification protocol from uh, Apple and Google, where they come together. Uh, it's quite unprecedented because for the two uh, competing tech giant to come together and work together on this, I think it's a good sign. Um, uh, however, I think it's, uh, there's an ideological difference here between what they do and what we do in Singapore. Um, what they, they believe in is what we call a decentralized model, where uh, the information is given to individuals and the decision is also in the hands of the individuals right, to decide whether or not I want to isolate myself to decide or not whether or not uh, the exposure that I had or contact I had with a potentially a COVID positive patient is a substantial one to be considered as a close contact 
in fact, then I, as an individual, will be expected to then become the epidemiological expert to know whether or not I'm, uh, the exposure is meaningful, and hence I need to isolate myself. And even if I know it's meaningful, it's also up to me to decide whether I want to isolate myself or I want to continue to act in a socially irresponsible way and go out and party. Right? So I, I think uh, ideologically, there's a decentralized model that's promoted by Google and Apple, whereas in Singapore, uh, we take a centralized model where uh, if someone is tested positive, uh, we will request for the cooperation of the person to send the data to us. You will be analyzed by our epidemiologists. Uh, you will be analyzed by our data scientists to determine whether or not uh, this is deemed as a close contact and not just based on the data alone. Right? We also have interviews. We talk to the people uh, to understand the context within which the, 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 the contact happened. And then based on that, we decide whether there are some people who should be served a quarantine order and isolated from the rest of the community. So, so I think there are two different models. It's, it's which one you believe in. Uh, uh, I personally feel that I will trust the epidemiologists uh, better and, uh, and, and doctors, medical professionals better than to trust myself to decide whether or not I should be isolated. Yeah, over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... Right. Um, um, you, if I uh, go back to uh, Mr. Suarez, uh, can you explain in detail? I think you, I, you, you mentioned um, at the beginning of the session about um, how Novartis is using AI in um, as part of your uh, a development process or your your product. Um, our services. So, can you, uh, uh, which one, you know, uh, which one uh, of the aspects of business that Novartis is using uh, AI more extensively? Maybe you can share with us. Um, uh, Definitely. Thank you for the questions. Yeah. So, um, so pretty much, you know, uh, one aspect that, you know, I would like to answer as well on the previous question was in the terms of, you know, what is stopping us from uh, AR broader use, right? And I believe that uh, we, uh, uh, as a, a large pharma company, we identify very quickly that, you know, pharma as itself, as a general, we are not the, the best uh, suitable to, to really make the journey alone. So that's where we started the journey, just to really engage with startups and companies that are really the experts on this field. Right? Uh, and pretty much we are right now, as we speak, uh, deploying Biome Hubs. That is an initiative that pretty much allow us to harvest the power of the ecosystem uh, across the world uh, in our location globally, where we are looking for really engaging with the ecosystem to to do uh, more around uh, cutting edge technology, including artificial intelligence. Uh, and this work in a way that, you know, really allow uh, Novartis to access uh, early promising technology uh, and as well on those uh, startups to scale those products uh, or those ideas in a meaningful way, because pretty much we are do link it to those with uh, real business needs. And as I said before in the intro, pretty much uh, our need, especially on the commercialization go to market part has to do with two aspects to get the, the access to, to medicine uh, and awareness of disease, to get diagnosis at twice as fast. Uh, and reality is that, you know, we are not doing so well in, in many of our market in, in that sense, right? In reality, that uh, in many cases, including the advanced market on the terms of healthcare system, uh, still diagnosis take a, a long time. Uh, on the other side, and related with COVID as well, you know, uh, reality is that many chronic diseases that are uh, supposed to be not requiring um, a, a hospital facility, a, a, a place where you know that those things can be diagnosed, they still are being diagnosed at, at hospitals or, or clinics, uh, and that create a, an extra burden and times where you know the whole healthcare system uh, is uh, at the limit. So where you know artificial intelligence can really keep an eye on, on those uh, signals that really require uh, intervention uh, or also in their terms of diagnosis, many of those things can be doing through telehealth. Uh, and that is another important area for us to, to look at where our therapies can be accessing at twice as the uh, number of people if we are doing the diagnosis right, because we are very conscious about the fact that, you know, in many cases, 
the diseases are not being diagnosed uh, on time and pandemic uh, like COVID is creating an extra burden on people that require that attention because the the healthcare system are, are being uh, to the limit. So personally, I envision that you know uh, healthcare uh, in the ter- in the form of uh, telehealth gonna rapidly expand with the help of artificial intelligence, hopefully as well. Uh, and we're gonna see in the next uh, five years um, a complete transformation on the whole uh, patient journey. We call it is in a way we get diagnosis uh, through treatment. Uh, and that's going to represent in a few years from now a complete uh, new setup uh, that right now is moved by the crisis. But uh, I do see that as one of the positive uh, outcomes uh, of this uh, crisis where we're going to have a much more efficient system uh, where we're going to be able to access health uh, anywhere at any time uh, without the restriction of the physical location like used to be in the past. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I know whether um, uh, how many minutes more do we have? So well, uh, Haslina, it's almost yeah. time. Uh, so time, right? Yeah. So I'm closing it now. Okay. All right. Thank you. I first of all, I would like to um, um, uh, maybe each of the uh, panel to quickly, maybe in one or two sentences, to wrap up um, and and share key messages that you have to the audience about AI and coronavirus and, and you know, our way forward. Can, can, shall we start with uh, Dr. Raji? Yeah, well, thank you for the moderation and uh, very constructive discussions. I would say uh, uh, AI started uh, strongly during the coronavirus, right, from the day one, but it's not going to go back. It's, you know, we're not going to go back to the normal uh, reality and try to... Uh, go back to the normal digital transformation and technologies. I think uh, there's a vast difference between digital transformation or what people understand as digitization and going towards uh, machine learning and AI and deep learning, etc. So I think there is no way back for people to go or the companies to invest in traditional digitization because that will be wasted in a few years. They will have to replace it. So uh, that's the message for all the corporates that start thinking and uh, putting this as a new strategy. Thank you very much. Um, um, Ms. Makalinao? Uh, can you please uh, unmute again? Sorry. Thank you. Okay, so uh, once again, uh, thank you very much for hosting us, for inviting the Department of ICT uh, to this. Um, actually, in these uncertain times, you know, uh, I learned that, you know, in terms of uh, going back to the disinformation, you know, when uncertainty is high, it seems that our, it, it drives our brains to seek as much information as possible to feel in somehow we're in control, you know, to, to somehow have that control. However, we've seen how misinformation has has led to more troubles, even more than the pandemic itself. And so the use of AI in such technologies uh, actually help, uh, helps governments in controlling these types of uh, um, an, an offshoot of other problems because of this pandemic. And so uh, there's no other way to go but to move forward with uh, the use harnessing these technologies to ensure this the the, the safety of everyone and governments, it's good to know that governments are slowly and really uh, starting to embrace, you know, these technologies, especially AI. They, they're seeing the value of, of using big data analytics. And I think it's, only the, uh, it's the only way you can really move forward in containing this. Uh, this Thank problem. you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. McAlenel. And uh, we'll, we'll pass to um, uh, Mr. Suarez. Yeah, your closing you. uh, message. Thank you for having me. Uh, and just to to a closing message on the importance of data, right? I, I personally have been working back in university 20 years ago on artificial intelligence. And this is nothing new and it came many, many other years back. The uh, reality is that computation power has improved as well. But reality is that we require a mindset shift, in my opinion, to really capitalize on the sense of artificial intelligence power in the future. And that has to do with the fuel of artificial intelligence that is data. 
right? And when we really focus on that, and it's a huge topic that has multifaceted because also we do need to be conscious about data privacy, but as well on the benefits of rich data and quality data are gonna bring to artificial intelligence that is at the core of any transformation or artificial intelligence that we, we envision uh, on the future. And with that, you know, I really um, embrace the fact that, you know, we are to see the, the value in healthcare on the future of artificial intelligence. Uh, but again, that has to do with the democratization of the data and also in consolidation, yes. by, because today, due to the fact that we do have many different players on the market, uh, yeah. we do see um, a complete um, distribution of the data. Uh, and right now, if we do uh, want to to use it to the power of artificial intelligence, we do need to tend to consolidate that for the sake of, of running the value out of the shoes, Thank out you. of artificial intelligence. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you very much, Mr. Suarez. Uh, finally, um, last but not least, um, uh, Mr. Wong, would like to uh, share a closing message? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks. I think specific to COVID, um, I think we are only very early into the pandemic. Uh, it was only six, seven months. I know it felt it felt like six, seven years into the pandemic, uh, but we are still very early in this pandemic. And there's, there are a lot of things we do not know about the, the disease um, and the virus. Uh, so I think there's a need to uh, do a longitudinal study on the long-term effect of COVID-19. Um, I, I think that's important. And, and uh, the, the way government can come in really is to provide funding to do so uh, and access to data and work with researchers uh, to make that happen. So that's specific to COVID. I think this pandemic has also shed light on how um, uh, lack of investments in uh, uh, pandemic preparedness uh, uh, has very dire consequences. And I think not just COVID, but beyond COVID to look at all different uh, infectious diseases, we do need to look at how uh, the, the emergency preparedness for pandemic uh, can be better strengthened uh, obviously, uh, again, from a government perspective, uh, more funding can be allocated to uh, this, this uh, preparedness fund in order for us to be able to uh, prepare ourselves for a future pandemic that will, be, that will come inevitably. Um, so I think that's important. And, and uh, another note is that uh, I don't think we can build everything centrally. So I, I don't think government will mm -hmm. try to do everything uh, within the government. Instead, uh, we have to galvanize the entire community, right? whether it's the uh, academia, the research community, uh, everyone else, the uh, private sector to come together and, and work together with the government to look at how then we can better prepare ourselves. I, I think there will be a core uh, capability that needs to be built within the government, but uh, beyond this core group, uh, they have to be able to galvanize uh, the larger community mm -hmm. out there to work together uh, so that we are better prepared. That's very true. Very, thank you. very true. Thank you very much. So I would like to thank um, the organizer for having us here. Uh, thank you to the audience for um, listening to the session. And and of course, thank you to all the uh, the panel uh, panelists uh, for the <coughs> session. And I hope that the audience will enjoy your uh, the, the, the uh, World AI show um, until the end. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Haslina, and thank you to the entire panel for joining us today.